hello, and welcome back to another episode of Minority Reports Podcast and Digital Series. I am your host, Mona Shake. You guys, it is happy Friday, or happy Friday, as some of my friends like to say it. Happy Friday, everybody. James, happy Friday. It's so nice that this week is finally over. It has been a long, long week for me. So I am glad it's over. I'm going to smoke my week tonight uh, and chill the fuck out. Uh, very excited. Got my stash already yesterday, so I'm very excited. But I'm, you know what I'm really excited about is my guest today because I watched her, and uh, she's a fellow New Yorker. She is in New York, and she was kind enough to do this last minute for me, so I'm very grateful. She just shot a brand new movie in Staten Island called Eltingville. She's appeared on Showtime's Women of a Certain Age. She's been on Comedy Central. She's an OG. She's been around. Here's my very talented, funny friend, Vanessa Hollingshead. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Great to be here. Nice to nice to see you. Thank you so much for uh, doing this. I uh, I saw you shaking your head when I said I'm gonna smoke some weed after this, and uh, you were like, yeah, you were smiling, and then you were like, yeah. I Vanessa, never in my life have I spent so much money on drugs the way I have this pandemic. Holy shit! I I do a joke. Um... Uh, I, I, I thought of a joke. It's like uh, with the with the um, with the hand disinfectant. Uh, and you know, everyone was smelling of hand disinfectant. And, and uh, now, what am I going to do to hide my alcoholism? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, now but, you have an excuse. Now you have an excuse. Yeah, You're like uh, my, uh, my my imminent, my reawakened alcoholism. <laughs> Your reawakened alcoholism. Yeah. Every time I get on the elevator, everybody reaches of hand sanitizer, and I went end up missing my drunk. My drunk uh, alcohol, my drunk uh, dad. Uh, you know, I was reading, Vanessa, your dad is British, uh, mm-hmm. or was British. And uh, right. right before we started this conversation, you mentioned that your mom was Russian. Now, your dad, I read this fun fact on she Good Old Russian Home. American. Her parents were Russian. Oh, she was Russian American. She was very embarrassed because they had, you know, the thick accent. Oh, and so well, she, but now as she got older and her mother died, she was like, I was such a snob. And I'm like, and so I, I got more of her, my grandma's quality and she got more. Right. Yeah. But she, you know, she grew up, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was reading about your dad, that your dad introduced LSD to Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney and, well, and Timothy Leary and wow. uh, Timothy Leary got all the credit. Um, and my dad kind of got forgotten about, you know, so yeah. I ended up working on a book, uh, helping a writer, Andy Roberts, a book came out about him called the divine rascal. And I had done a one person show all about him and the one person show it. And I did it with my writing partner and we're still writing partners 21 years later. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we've had a long friendship and we, there's times we've stopped or we've gone our separate ways. She went to work on this. I went to work on that, but she would yeah. became a yoga instru- instructor. I mean, this woman is brilliant. Yeah. And we've been working on this and uh, we just finished doing a, the deck, you know, and the, the yeah. beat sheet and the Bible. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and we would love to, it's never, they've never been dramatized these, you know, these people. So it's the first time that it's been dramatized, you know, the history of LSD, nobody knows it. Yeah. And that he, you know, my dad did give it to Timothy Leary and I accidentally took it at five when I was living at Millbrook mansion with Timothy Leary and my dad. So that was, um, you know, my- Wait, you took LSD by accident when you were five. How, was, how does that, how does that happen? How, was, how does a five year old have access to LSD? They used to put LSD. I think sometimes they put it into grapes uh, and sugar cubes because you would have a better. You know, it was better. It would go into your system a little bit better. You wouldn't get so sick. And I, you know, I loved sugar. I was a little sugar addict, and uh, I was always hungry all the time because there was always like hippies around and drugs and pot and hash and alcohol and uh you know just ate a bunch of them and then the next thing i know I'm, j- I'm jumping on the trampoline and i just remember seeing all these fluorescent worms like just tons of fluorescent worms and i remember uh, and i started screaming for my dad and my dad's girlfriend gra- grabbed me off the trampoline and my dad i came into the house and the, well the mansion and i said you know my nails are getting 
short or my nails are disappearing and pictures are ripping. And my dad was like, oh, God, she got into the LSD. So he drove me to Richard Alpert's little little guest house and he became Baba Ram Das. He ended up giving up all of that stuff and getting an Indian wow. you know, guru and then becoming like a, like a, uh, like a guru himself. Wow. Rish Maharishi. Um, and he said that Maharishi Maharishi, he gave, he's so enlightened that he gave a little hit, hit tab, of, a, a big tab of acid to him and it had no effect. Huh? Yeah, that's that's what they that's what happened. It had no effect on this uh, on this um, you know guru. Wow, because he was so enlightened, or he just had done so much LSD. He had done a lot of LSD, but he realized that that LSD and all the like the suffering, the craving, like enlightenment has to come from meditation. And really learning how to meditate and really learning how to always come from a place of love. Like even if you hate people, you come to a place where you love them. And that real love and real freedom would, would be a lot of hard work. And that's what he wanted to learn. And he was never going to, he was going to get that experience for 11 or 12 hours on LSD, but he could get it permanently if he actually learned and studied with this Maharishi, Mar Maharishi. With this Maharishi, I mean, my there's God, so Maharishis. There's like you know, yeah, yeah. Swami Maharishi, Maharishi Maharishi, Ronesh Rab Maharishi. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of. I I uh, I've never heard of Maharishis before, but uh, it George makes Harrison sense. Had one. Ma George Harrison had. Um, George Harrison. Okay, that sounds about right. Well, because yeah, the Beatles were very big hippies. I mean, they were giant hippies for God's sake. Yeah, of course. That makes Ringo. Ringo was like, "Don't like the curry. Don't curry. Don't, <laughs> don't want to stay here. I want to go back to Liverpool." Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, let's not forget that the official food of Britain is curry. Like, that's the official food. They changed it, um, I think, it was probably, what, maybe fish and chips before, and then you changed it to curry? Yeah. I mean, some of the best curry in the world is in England. It's not even in India. It's in England. Like, it's the food there is just magical. Like, I don't know what the hell they put it in there. became uh, magical because became magical. England was awful. It, in India... Like people were able to eat again. I mean, yeah. that's why there's so much alcoholism because the food was horrible. You would lose weight in England. It was so bad. And people were you want curry? Yes, yeah, that's curry. I don't want your cooking. <laughs> Fish and chips. Are you a curry fan? Do you like Indian food? Yeah. I make Indian food too. Oh, good for it. you. Oh, good for you. That's Tana amazing. Masala, uh, beef vindaloo, but I know the cow is sacred, so... Um, are you, uh, you're not vegetarian though you're not a vegetarian no i tried it was a yeah. it was a hard few weeks i'm not listen i'm not i'm a giant steak eater so please yeah. like uh, you know no not, are you no. indian are you in is your background I'm, Indian? yeah i am i'm part my dad was indian my mom's uh pakistani and my grandfather was persian wow so i'm so like mom was uh, indian your dad pakistani dad, dad indian mom pakistani yeah. And wasn't that like two star-crossed lovers? Like you know, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. They're they're two jaded lovers. That's exactly what they are. They're two. Do family? Yeah, they were they were one, and then they were, and then one. India was like, I don't want to be with you, and Pakistan was like, I don't want to be with you either. And then they split up, and they're still fighting about it. So they're like this jaded couple. That's who they love each other. But wasn't it like the if you you love is a strong word, Vanessa. Yeah. If yeah. you're from Pakistan, yeah. And they say, oh wow, are you in from India? They're like, no, I'm from Pakistan. That's right. That's right. Pakistan is. Are you Pakistani? Yeah. No, I'm from no, India. I'm from India. That's right. Because you know, uh, Advil and ibuprofen is so different. Uh, yeah, it's so different. Yeah, it's right. so stupid. Uh, it's quite ignorant, if you ask me. Uh, to me, Pakistanis are former Indians. Like, that's who we are. Like, we were all this one giant country. Bangladesh was part of India. Pakistan was part of India. I mean, it was this just massive country. And then we split up and, like, I don't like your curries. Like, I don't like your curry either. And now they're, like, fighting. It's so stupid. Uh, same people. Exact same people. But, Vanessa, I wanted to go back. And ask you, like, when you, when you, I mean, in, you know, you started doing comedy, what, in the 90s? 
Yeah, I, started, yeah. Like, I was like a trained Shakespearean actress. You know, I came from my acting wow. roots and doing characters and I would meet somebody, I'd be able to imitate them very easily. And unfortunately, because of so much of this cancel culture, all the accents they do and the characters, I can't really do because I, I think I offend white women or white men, you know? I, I certainly don't offend Indians, German, yeah. Jewish, yeah. Uh, Russian, they laugh because they yeah. know it's from, from love. But um, yeah, but I came from serious acting. I studied at Lee Strasberg and one of my teachers later became like Michael Imperioli from The Sopranos. So oh, I had, love him. Jesus, love him. And he's a, like a heavy duty Buddhist. Oh, really? I did not know that. Wow, Michael Imperioli, huh? Yeah, and he's got a podcast too. I bet. I mean, uh, all the big celebrities, everybody who establishes in the podcasting game, for sure, hundred thousand percent. I mean, Vanessa. So you're you're a what? You're a you're a stage actor. You're at the time you're a trained Shakespearean actress. And what makes you go? I'm gonna do stand up at a time when I would think that in the '90s there weren't a lot of female comics. I mean, there are a lot more now, but back then, holy shit! What are you like one ten who are up there? Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, um, I was working as a temp at the time, you know, and then going to acting class. And I just, I remember thinking, is that all that there is? And my roommate, literally, I was living in Astoria. And my roommate said, you know, my, watch this. My story. old hood. My old hood, Vanessa. Yeah, your old hood. Yeah, I love this. I actually love this story. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, 30th uh, Drive. I would take the end to 30th, 30th, okay. 30th Avenue and get up 30th Drive. And then I lived at Broadway. Take the end train to Broadway. Yep, that's and right. I go to Signway Street, go to the thrift store there, and you know. You didn't have a. You didn't have Greek men following you and be like, "Come, go, have coffee in my coffee yeah. shop." Come. No, sometimes we had a Greek landlord, and it was a born again Christian, so he would be very funny. We'd, he'd be fixing my pipes and be like, "The Jesus is like the. It's like the pipes. You can't get nothing comes clean." Like, but I'm like, just get the pipe. And I went, yeah, yeah, no, no. You're like, what did Jesus have to do with pipes? Like, yeah. what? It's like, you cl Jesus cleanses your soul. And you, Jesus, I'm trying to, I can't even do a Greek accent. <laughs> <laughs> Greek accent uh, that I know, like, Tecanus, and I did jokes on the Greeks, like, you know, after the Romans invaded you, what did you come up with? Like, yogurt? Yogurt and diners. They were like, this. They were yogurt, like, yogurt. Yeah, yogurt and diners. <laughs> So, well, anyway, um, long story is short, so I don't go off on a tangent. Um, I was doing, like, plays that would be too embarrassing. My, my roommate said, I never find these uh, sitcom, these sitcoms as in funny as when you talk about your day at work, when you imitate everybody, your bosses, the people you work with, and you should try stand-up comedy. I was like, oh, you got to be me oh, honest. No, 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 no. And she's like, I'm, I'm telling you, I think you would really be good. No, I'm yeah. good when you come home, making you laugh and telling stories. So I took a comedy class and then I went to just did it a month and wrote five minutes. And it was my first time performing at Gladys Simon's Club on Third Avenue. And I remember I got a couple of the girls from work to come. Yeah, and it was my first time doing comedy. I must have had like 20 Diet Cokes and chain smoking. And um I finally went on like 36 comics later and the girls from the an open mic, right? This is an open mic. Yeah. yeah. Open mic. And it, all my, like the girls were falling asleep. You had to be up early for work. We worked in the, um, you no, know, I was like a word processor. So we worked for like 80 different companies and, um, I made, I made jokes and no one barely laughed. And I'm like, you know, you know what? After 36 comics, Richard Pryor could come up here and but you'd probably go, you wouldn't even care. And right. And I talked about how I lost all my hair because I put hair straightener in for if you were black, black hair straightener. And in 10 minutes, uh, you know, had no hair. And um, I was like, this really happened. This was kind of fun. It's funny now. It wasn't funny at the time. And I got a little, but it was that I was like, I am home. This is what I want to do. And mm -hmm. I don't have to rely on actors I, for like, I don't have to rely on directors. I don't have to rely on plays. I just have to rely on myself. The only person I have to worry about getting the writing done and doing all the work is me. Right, right, right. And it's a great freedom. That's right. A lot right. of responsibility, but right. also a lot of freedom. Right. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's a pros and cons. Yeah. If I discipline myself and did all the writing, 
Yes. I could maybe make something happen in my life. And I wouldn't have to worry about anybody. Because I would work with actors. We'd do a play. And I was doing a lot of plays. I couldn't get arrested with agents. I couldn't get seen. It was, And I thought, what is going to become of me? And I was like 31 when I, when I started doing comedy. I'm like, when is this ever? Am I going to be a secretary my whole life and just take acting classes mm-hmm. and be an off, off, way the fuck off Broadway show? You know, that, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. the guy who likes you, who hopes to get laid later on, would go to and say, well, I'm really conceptual. So I just couldn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that what I mean? <laughs> yeah. your, uh, your story sounds very, very similar to mine because I had a day job. Uh, I was, I started off as an assistant working on the trading floor in New York City on Park Avenue for Citibank and then ended up getting promoted to be an analyst. And, you know, you're making really fucking, you're making six figures. Like I know my, that city bank on 53rd and Park, right? That's right. That's right. That's 53rd and Park. That's it. Yeah, that was my uh, that was my old uh, job, and I got paid a lot of money. But you know, when the market crashed, and I was like, "This is a sign from God for me to get the hell out of here because I fucking hate this." Like people doing sorting fucking cocaine on their desks at four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I don't want this shit. Like this is a yeah garbage lifestyle people cheating on their spouses i'm like this is your life you make all this money and you're miserable who cares this sucks you know but for you you, yeah thank you i mean did you did you go to college or did you just kind of go to acting school and was doing this day day gigs to survive I, i lived breathed and ate um acting and I t- took some courses at college. I actually took college. I actually graduated at 14 and a half years old. I went to a private school and graduated in Boston. Um, wow. And the school was Shaw Prep and it ended up getting, getting burned down. And so did my, and they never kept records of my high school diploma. And I had one. I lost it in all the traveling. I did a oh, lot of traveling. Oh, no. Yeah. And, um, but I went to Emerson College in conjunction with, with Shaw Prep. And yeah. I, and then, um, Lee Strasberg was affiliated with NYU and then I auditioned for NYU and I got in, but they yeah. thought I was 16 and they're like, I was just 15 and they're like, we can't, I mean, you gotta be 18 at, at the wow. moment. I was 17. So all these opportunities. And then because I had so many problems with my parents, you know, my mom was a bit of a pothead my dad, you know, with the mood swings and the drinking. Um, I remember thinking, uh, they're not gonna. If only they would have helped me fill my forms. Like in hindsight, you know, when you get older and you had that's right. pride. That's right. And you. I like, was just gonna say that actually. I was just gonna say that. Like, if your parents stepped up and were like, "Hey, we're guardians. Like, we approve of this. Like, even though she's 15. Right. I didn't even ask. I thought I'll figure these forms out myself. Or I don't need anybody. And they would have. Yeah. My mother was very smart. My dad would have been. They would have been very proud. And I just. That I'll figure this out on my own. I don't need anybody. I don't. And my dad wanted to get me into Harvard. He was like, I've got contacts. You finished at 14 and a half. You're a straight A student. I could get you into Harvard. Yeah. And I remember saying to him, I want to be an actress and I will make my own way, dad. I don't need your help. And it was one of the, I wish I would have asked for his help, but I knew the emotional price tag would be too high. Mm-hmm. And, but I did it because I was so hurt that he left us so early that he left me when I was like, you know, two and we we're back and forth a little bit and mm-hmm. we drank a lot. And my mother was, you know, a little crazy. And sometimes I think she might've had a broken heart. I don't know what happened, but she kind of just changed her personality. But I was so angry at my dad. And um, in hindsight, I didn't have enough wherewithal to, to just say, yeah, you know, let me go to Harvard. And he said, you know, you can go to Harvard and you'll graduate at, you know, 18, 19, and then you can go to acting, but you'll be around all these uh, well, you know, well educated people and you can basically do whatever right. you want. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, what is it? Do you feel like that? you know, the things that you just described the way your mom was, the way your dad was, the fact that your dad, you know, basically like you felt, I, I'm sure as a child, you felt abandoned at the age of two where you're just like, fuck, you just abandoned us. Like you just, and are, are you an only child or are you, you are only child? I was an only child with my parents. And then, yeah. and, but my best friend, Gracie, I met her when I was, we're still best friends. She was two and I was three. Uh-huh. 
I mean, we've been, it was like, you know, like I had an instant sister and her mother oh. took care of me when my mother couldn't, you know, do it. But yeah. um, uh, there was so, but my dad, I've got a baby sister that's 18 years younger and three nieces that I'm in love with. I adore They're in oh. England. And it was COVID, I would have visited them. Yeah. And then I have a stepbrother from his first marriage that's Danish. And at one point we all got together, had a family dinner and then, uh, my dad's sisters in Scotland, and then I've got um, I've got cousins that are that are English and Scottish. So all my family that's alive is in England and in Scotland. What about the What about your mom's side? All dead. She has what? No, you have, don't have uncles. You don't have nothing from really. Wow. Yeah, my uncle. Di- when my mother died, I went to go tell, and it was like they had. A, it was a bad falling out with my uncle, never talked to her. And he did something so horrible to my mother. And I said, listen, if you don't, you know, do the right thing Mm -hmm. by my mother, when you have Mm -hmm. everything and she has nothing, Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm never going to talk to you again. Yeah. Never did, you know, in support of my mother. Like, even though my mother was crazy, she was still my mother and she was still honest. Yeah. Yeah. And she took care of her father till the day he died. And so one of those things. You know, it's incredible about women that, um, you know, I, I think it's a global thing about women that there's always this additional pressure that's put on females to be the caretakers that we're always, we always put ourselves second and everybody else is first. So first it's our parents and our siblings, then you get married, then it's your husband, then you have kids and it's your kids and you're always playing, you know, second banana in your own freaking life. So you know, the way you describe your mother, you know, you describe her as crazy, D- define crazy. So for instance, like my mom uh, was, was and is to m- in many, many ways, pretty fucking bad shit. And the reason that she is bad shit, because my mom experienced a shit ton of fucking trauma growing up, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom got married at 17. She had me uh, uh, at the age of 23. I was her fifth child at the age of 23. Zero support system. Her parents just like threw her out and just married her off to my dad. Uh, my dad's side of the family was so fucked up. They were so abusive. And my father became very physically abusive towards my mother. I mean, and she has to survive in all this chaos and this typhoon of fucking bullshit that's being tossed at you, yeah, you're gonna get a little fucking crazy. You have no one to turn to. So, and of course, then I think she just also developed these really sociopathic, narcissistic, you know, uh, habits, which were very destructive, but we didn't have the language to describe that. So when you say crazy about your mother, describe crazy. Okay, and I do have cousins, uh, but I have nothing to do with them because, you know, they were on that side of the family. And we never got in contact. So I just, uh, I'm estranged. So as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're gone. And they said something really awful when I have an old, a, a, like a distant cousin. And she's so proud of me. And she's in Arizona. And she talked to one of my cousins. And he said, and she said, aren't you, you, you love to watch Vanessa's comedy? And she's so successful. She's done so well. And they were like, well, if you call that being successful, you know what I mean? I'm like, I, we are done. I don't need this energy. That's right. when you flip right. the, what's when you give the middle finger. That's right. Um, yeah. And my mother. Sounds like, sounds like a ton of jealousy to me. Sounds like a pretty jealous group of people to me. Just, I don't even know what they're like, but they were just, you know, and my mother, like, I think my uncle, her brother did something to her. I don't know what happened, but I think something happened because I found letters after she died. Hmm. And um, she, we ended up living in bed We lived, and this was the late 60s, and I was a little girl. And, you know, she'd gotten beaten, raped, trauma. I was traumatized. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't go to school. They'd break in constantly. Mm. And she just wanted me to learn how to be tough in that neighborhood. Like I was like, I was going to get put in a reform school. And that's when this woman, Grace, came in and took me in. Mm. And my mother like wore her bra over her dress. She had all her teeth knocked out. She never got them replaced. She said, I want to be a walking billboard for the dental, you know, industry to no, the dental profession to know that what they did to me by giving me caps. You know, she was one of these overly liberal, you know, she thought, well, she smoked pot in the train station, got arrested, started singing opera. They let her out. I mean, she was a little. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds um, resourceful. Yeah. 
Yeah, and she had a great sense of humor. I, her one of her jokes was, you know, when I met your father, I hated all men, and after I married him, I hated everybody. <laughs> oh wow! But I remember visiting her in St. Patrick's Nursing Home, and mm-hmm. she said, and she was very like Blanche Dubois. She was, that, she was like, my, oh. you want to know who my three favorite people are in this oh. world? And I thought she was going to say like me three times because I was up there four times mm-hmm. getting her fruits or vegetables. She was a vegetarian. She was me, myself, and I. Those are my favorite friends. And yeah. the nun said, you know, nun said, I don't mean to overhear stuff, but your daughter visits you a lot. And you were kind of bitchy to her. It was like one of the Carmelite nuns, you know, said you were a little on the bitchy side to her. And you've got a very good daughter. And my mother called me back. Oh, well, uh, you know, the nun said that I was a, a, a bitchy to you. So uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, what? Which is, by the way, Vanessa, let, she was like childlike. Yeah, but let's also put that in perspective. For people like your mother and my mother to even come to that place to bring themselves to be like, I'm sorry, it's <laughs> right. like it a massive achievement. It's massive. I once told my mother, she was always negative, what an awful world. I'm so sorry you were even born to bring you in this shithole. Like, and I'd be like, Mom, I'm doing, I'm doing well. All right, darling, how is your um your mimicking going? You know, and I'm like, oh my comedy career? That so I said, you know what, mom, you're so negative. So don't call me unless you have something positive to say. That's really right. don't right. call me until you said and I didn't hear from her for weeks. And now I'm met, and now I'm like, I hope she's all right. And I had to like, you know, when you just have to hold tight, yes, you've got to show them that. That's you, right. That you're standing your ground. Yeah, you're I'm standing, standing ground. my ground. And if I would have called yeah. mom, are you live? Are you okay? I love you. I'm sorry. It's mm-hmm. all my fault. I just got, you know, if you want to be negative, you go be negative. It was always like, yes. me. I, you can imagine the kind of yes. men I attracted. So yes. my abandonment issues. And um, yes. so that, she, sounds like the, that sounds exactly like my mother. Exactly. Yes. Well, like she that. called, I, but this was so funny. She goes, you told me don't call you. This was two months later. You told me to not call you unless they had something positive to say. <laughs> <laughs> you have two months. She was like, I can't come up with anything. Yeah. For two she goes, no, I I got a ripe cantaloupe. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and then I called her back and said, Mom, I love you. Thank you so much. Like I it's like I won the little battle. Yeah. You know, it's funny you brought up the reference of Blanche de Bois because that's exactly how I describe my mom. You know, I'm yeah. all dependent on the kindness of strangers. You know that line that she says? Yeah. Do you remember well, that? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm always dependent on the kindness of My mom is an incredibly uh, ambitious, smart woman. The reason that I'm sitting in the United States and having this conversation with you is thanks to my mother. Uh, we are the first family from our mom, our dad's side, to come to the West. No one in our family has ever ventured out, right? It was my mother who would stand in line at 5 o'clock in the morning in a U.S. embassy in the middle of Pakistan to, you know, for us to get visas to come to America. Not my father, my mother. 5 o'clock in the morning, a woman by herself in a line of all men standing there. I'm going to take my children to America. I'm going to give them a better life. That's my mother. That's so, amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And my mother told me to get on a waiting list. I live in Chelsea, which it must be my apartment. I got a one bedroom with a terrace. Uh, it, it's, it That'd be incredible. 3,500. 3, 3, I was on a waiting list for 17 years. Wow. And then my number came up. And all it was, and my mother put me on this list. She wow. goes, I know you love New York and, you know, you get it, you can afford it. I ended up buying a co-op and every time, and then when she died, she never even visited me. I had her ashes. Like, okay, mom, I want to show you. Here's my living room. Hope you like it. Here's, here's my bedroom. Here's my kitchen. Oh, I got some tomatoes. I know you like them. And I was like laughing and crying, you know. Oh. But it was like, and she, I'll never forget when I found out that, um, that it, that I couldn't have children. And the mm-hmm. first person I called was my mother, you know, that I, I just wasn't going to be able to have children. My husband had scleroderma. And she said, she said, children are very, very selfish. They need a lot. And I'm like, oh, right. You would know about how selfish they were. We both started laughing, right? Because you were always there. She goes, no, I'm a horrible mother. I admit that. Wow. Wow. 
they, and she goes, and your heart is so big and you have so much love to give. So maybe God, oh. maybe God thought in his infinite wisdom that mm-hmm. people love a lot and not worry about one. So yeah, yeah. And I'm like, how can this woman be so, and she, she, I was, devastated when I found I couldn't have children. I did jokes on Comedy Central about not getting, not being able to get pregnant. All jokes. Mm-hmm. But she comforted me yeah. in a way that a mother, only a yeah. mother can. Right. Right. So she, of all the times when she wasn't there for you, for that one big moment she came through, for one, that one, she put her bullshit aside and she was like, I gotta be here for my kid. Like, I gotta be here right now. You know? Which is, you know, God rest her soul for doing that, right? They, they, they got. I remember standing online, being an only woman in Pakistan back yeah. then. Yeah. You know, just standing online, they could have done anything to her. They could have thrown her off the line. They could have said no women. They could have, uh, you know, hurt That's her. Right. They could have like grabbed right. right. her stuff. They, I mean, they could have done anything to her. I don't want to get dark. Dark. I was just gonna say that. It's yeah, dark. yeah, yeah. She's still. Uh, just, I have lights on, and yeah. you know, there's a, a, a food truck. You know, it's not like it's. That's right. Not, That's right. That's right. It's not like oh, you're gonna go walk up to a cop and be like, "This man." It's it's not like that. The cop would be like, "Uh, oh, he touched you. Let me touch you too." You know, it's like, right. it's yeah. like that. It's so yeah. fucked up. But my, I mean, honestly, like I'm listening to you, and I'm listening to your mom, and I'm listening, you know, and I'm uh, comparing, you know, we're, you know, listening, you know, talking about my mom and. uh uh, honestly, as as messed up as they ha- were, and as messed up as my mom still is, they also gave birth to these uh, incredible two women that are having this conversation and who I've, are making waves. That well, you've already made uh, tons of waves in stand up comedy. I'm still up and coming and trying to, you know, uh, make a mark for myself. But uh, honestly, Vanessa, I feel like they're alchemists. Like, you know, they took like their old fucked up situation. And then hand it off to us. And then we were like, okay, we'll be alchemists too. We'll take these fucked up situations and all this pain and all this trauma and churn it into some kind of comedy gold. Do you feel like as a stand up comic, th- that pain has what always driven you, you know, to become an actress, to become a stand up comic, to keep going even in the face of absolute adversity? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, you know, there, I had a, I had a minister, she was like new agey and she was amazing. And she said, you know, you, you you chose your parents to yeah. grow your spirit. Yes. So you, and when she said that, like all the resentments I had, mom, how could you do this? Mm-hmm. You chose your spirit, your parents, because it was to grow your soul and deal with whatever mm-hmm. you needed to deal with, like finding courage, being mm-hmm. able to help. Um, being empathetic, being a survivor, mm-hmm. like with this COVID thing or with anything like I told God, I said, you know what? Please don't let me lose my mind. I will help people for the rest of my life. Don't let me lose my ability to help. And I will be of help as I get older, just yeah. let my brain intact and I will caretake whatever I have to do, but don't put me in a situation that I have to take care of any, that if someone has to take care of me, yeah. I don't want that situation. And yeah. We become so strong. Like I'm listening to you, and you worked at the, you know, at this at, on the Wall Street with yeah. a bunch of all guys, and all you know, macho guys. That yeah, it, it doesn't stink, and they co- all coked up and probably making passes <laughs> at you. And you're like, no, that's okay. no. I'd like to try something in there. Exactly. I had this one guy. He had a foot fetish. He was uh, from Ireland. He was very cute. Uh, now I'll never forget his name. John Madden was his name. Could he get any more Irish? Uh, and, uh, he was a sweetheart, but he had a severe foot fetish. And every time he would come around me, especially during summer, he would just like, not even look at me the entire time. He would just be like staring at my feet. And I was just like, I didn't know that was a thing. Like, I didn't know dudes were like into that. And more and more comics have now male comics have come forward and talked about it. Like Joe Coy talks about it. Russell Peter talks about how he has like, this severe foot fetish, but I, I, I didn't even know that was a thing. But Vanessa, when you're, you know, when you're the reason coming, why you have a foot fetish. That's why you have a foot fetish. Yeah, exactly. But here, uh, sorry, no, say that again. What were you saying about foot Where, fetish? I know the reason what creates a foot fetish. What creates a foot fetish? When you were a little kid, your mother would be getting ready to go to work and 
she would be putting her shoes on or getting ready to, and she'd be leaving you. So you were very little and all you would see is these shoes and it's actually abandonment. So you would feel love when you'd want her love. So you transferred that feeling of loss and love onto shoes, just like you meet people that remind you of your parents uh, oh. because they, and then you try and fix, fix the healing, heal yourself when they have some of the qualities that, that ha they have. A, that's how you get the foot fetish. You're blowing my mind right now. No one has ever been able to explain to me why people have foot fetish. I was like, it's yeah. just encoded in your There's DNA. A child crawling around and the mother doesn't oh. have any time for them. And he just sees these shoes, you know, and that creates the, the mother child. And then the mother, do the mother child bond is very strong. And they can't bond, so they bond with the with the feet, with the shoes. Whoa! With the shoes. Sorry, did you like? Have you spoken to a therapist about this, or like? Uh, no, no, I I read about it. I was like, I'm one of these wow. Google guys. Like, I have to know everything. I'm like you, yeah. I'm like uh, you're like uh, yeah, what, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what well, people are like, why do you know that? I'm like, I don't know, I read it or you know, read, I, yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, yeah. It was so interesting that it always stayed with me. Yeah, that's incredible. Listen, you know, you mentioned um, your husband had scl uh, scleroderma, right? Yeah. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What is scleroderma? Scleroderma is a horrible autoimmune disease, and it's mm -hmm. it means hard skin. It's Greek for hard skin. And what happens is your body overproduces collagen. I'm surprised. I'm surprised women haven't said, "Oh yeah, I'll have a, <laughs> have a little scleroderma for a while," because it makes your face just go like this a little bit. But uh -huh. if you would get a pin prick on his finger, uh -huh. it would uh, it would take two months to heal because he couldn't get blood anywhere, and then he would have a Raynaud's attack. Eventually, had a, a finger you know um, amputated, and he was always in pain. And he had it for usually it's a women's disease. It's, it's related to stress. And he was the artistic uh -huh. director of the comic strip, so he had to you know help discover Chris Rock and. Um, Adam Sandler and you know the greats would be at the club. Richard Pryor, uh, not Richard Pryor, um, George Carlin, and wow, you know, wow, he, yeah. And he started off as a dancer and then a bartender and then worked his way up to manager. Wow. And um, yeah, he got it. And he was also he, he ran. He was a marathon runner, but he, he should have lasted at most six years and got it, had it for eighteen. Wow. And this is what, like, is it's an auto, is it hereditary or it just happens because your body just gets triggered by stress? Stress. And he, well, he has everything inside. He would stuff his feelings down. And the doctor mm -hmm. said, you know, you can't afford stress. So mm -hmm. if I would park on the wrong side of the street or we got towed because it left the lights on and I would be like, oh, oh God, Lucian, I know. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, like, I, I would go into a big thing and You'd be yeah. like, oh, that's, oh, honey, it happens. I assume that at least twice a year the car will get towed. So uh, would you want me to go down? I'll keep you company. We could joke around. We could talk. I'll keep you company. No, no, no. no. Why don't you go? With, no, Vanessa, you've done quite enough tonight. Uh, I'm going to read a book. I'm going to bring a book with me. I'll wait online. I'll get the car. I'll drive it home. I will find a parking spot. Incredible. And he said, I can't, and he wouldn't let himself get, I, it was, it was like I was learning from the master how to calm down. He never sweated the little shit and he didn't because wow. he couldn't, because if he would get stressed, mm -hmm. he would activate the, the scleroderma. Wow. The scleroderma would be like. It's, it's, it's autoimmune disease and stress related. Holy shit. Vanessa, you said he had it for 18 years? Yeah, 18 years. So uh, uh, does he have to it would, like, level out and then it would get worse again and then it would level out and then it, would get, and it was like on all kinds of pills and medications. And I used to find little gloves for him that he could mm. then got, got gadgets that he could pull up his pants and turn a light on. I mean, and, and wow. then it just got really bad. Then it, it got into his lungs and his lungs got infected and they started to get hard. And that's kind of what oh, so. Him his lung it can go into so it's not a skin disorder it goes on the inside in your organs yeah, on the inside yeah it hardens everything and a lot of people get esophagus problems or they get it in the and it could go in different places i mean it's just an awful 
disease. And I did a bunch of benefits for scleroderma, you know, after he died for a few years and uh, they still haven't found a cure. And um, wow. you know, that's that. Wow. How long were you guys married for before he passed away? We were together for 10 years, but married for 14 months. Wow. And I got to perform for the troops there. So I did one show. I was in Pakistan for a couple of days and I did one show for like one of the, not the prime minister, but you know, high up. And yeah. they said, uh, you know, it was like 180 degrees and we're all performing and, you know, <laughs> that's behavior. Sounds about right. 180. That sounds about right. Yeah. It was very hot. <laughs> Where in Pakistan were you? You remember? We were on an army base. Everything was an undisclosed location. I mean, if Got I knew it. the city, I don't know what city we were in. And then we were in Riyadh and Got then, it. Um, Afghanistan. I think Afghanistan. We were all over the Middle East. Yeah. 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 Performing all over. Vanessa, the, when your husband passes on, and um, which I can't even imagine must have been so incredibly devastating for you, what what does that do for you? Does that I mean, I can tell you're a very spiritual person. You, you know, you've clearly done a lot of work on yourself for personal growth. Do you, do you question God? Do you question faith? Do you question uh, life? You're like, what the fuck? I went through this with my dad. I went through shit with my mother. I found a man I love. And then this shit happens. What the fuck? Yeah, I got very angry, God. Mm -hmm. I got very angry. And then I had a huge deal too that fell apart because I trusted this business after being in comedy. And Lucian, my husband, you know, I, I got offered the Drew Carey show for 260 grand when I only had two years in the business. Wow. And um, they wanted to make me third lead on this Carsey Warner show. And Carsey Warner is very hot that time, like in 95, 96. I'd only been doing comedy for a couple of years. But wow. working my ass off, and within two weeks, I had like 80 meetings, and everyone wanted wow. me. Wow. And I turned it down because Carsey Warner said, We'll make you third lead to play a cop. I mean, if anyone could play a cop, I could play a cop. Yeah. Isn't that, I mean, I look like a cop. It's like, Yeah, okay, Mona, one second. I got, I'm sorry, we got a, I got a, I got a floater in the, the Hudson River. It's been very nice meeting you. We'll continue at a later date. You know, I mean, I just, I could be <laughs> Yeah. So wait a minute. So you turned down the Drew Carey show for the, the Carson show? Is that it? At the Carsey Warner show. They were going to oh, develop it. Show. Steven Zahn got that thing you do with Tom Hanks. And I he was supposed to be my love interest. And then I went from hot, hot, hot to ice cold. And I had worked so hard, mm. you know, from like working in the theater, stage managing in London to going to acting school, to working at Dean and DeLuca 80 and 90 hours, to getting scholarships. And to, I was like, God, what you, you, is this some kind of like cosmic joke? You're mm -hmm. cruel. Mm -hmm. And I remember just, I kind of stopped believing in God. And uh, Lucian said, you know what? You're gonna have to make yourself undeniable. And we weren't even dating then. And I said, well, I'll get another chance. He goes, you might've, you know, shot your wad. That's what he said. And you might never have, get another um, another chance to make a first impression. You might never get a second chance to make a first impression. So I got really funny in 19, 20, 19 years. And then the, and then we got the uh, funny women of a certain age. And we were getting ready to go on Broadway, do Vegas, tour around, and then COVID. And I'm like, what the, what the, what is, what is this? What is this? And then I was working on my one woman show and then I stopped that and then Jeannie and I reconnected and we worked on that. We get so far and then something would happen. We'd have meetings. And I just, I started to, I had to reaffirm my belief in God mm -hmm. and let go of my belief on how I think my life should be. And mm -hmm. I realized, I remember being upset about Lucian and I had just taped on my Comedy Central special when he died. And and I thought, someone said to me, your job or God's job for you was to keep him alive. That was your yeah. time on earth, was to keep him alive, not to go into your next phase with your, your career. So when I should have been working more on that and getting an agent and saying, look at this, because I got a standing ovation, I was like, just you know, taking care of him. 
and uh, just very confused at the time. And I had some, you know, I was drinking way more than I should have drank. And yeah. Really just you were self-medicating. You were self-medicating, down. Vanessa. I spiral down and I didn't even, and yeah. I managed to pull myself up from that. But I had to find, I had to clean up my act, get over him. I was devastated. And two days after he died, I started, I was still doing comedy because I knew he would want that. Yeah. And I had to find a, like some kind of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that was my, when someone said, no, that was your job. Everyone has a job on earth to do. It's not about your career, your relationship. It's like you, you right. help and love and serve. And that kind of was like, okay, God, I did my job very well. And, um, yeah, that was what happened. And I, I did find my faith again, you know, yeah, I did find my faith again. And some, and someone said, I said, how do you know you're in God's will and not your will? And my friend said, if something comes really easy, you're in God's will. If everything is so hard, you're in your own will. Mm. Difference. Mm. If you're a hard worker and like nothing phases you and you're like, I'll figure it out. I won't take no for an answer. No one's going to, the only person I ever really competed with. And the other thing with my mother, she was so beautiful that the only person I wanted to look like was my mother. And, um, so I never got jealous of women, like beautiful women. I just, I like beautiful women, but I never got jealous of them. I just, they were just yeah. beautiful, you know? So I never right. got competitive. I would just compete with myself. Yes. That yeah. just passed on to me too. A couple good things and redecorating. So I used to redecorate the apartment, but um, yeah. yeah, that's what I did. You know, I did. And it would, it's, and sometimes I, and, I, and my minister said, make God your best friend, make him your lover, make him the reason you go from the left to the right and, and just make him really there. And, you know, I'm not a born again Christian or anything, but she said the difference between everybody and Jesus, who is a man, is Jesus asked God for everything. We are very selective. And he had a beautiful relationship. And the moment you find this peace and this relationship, like you might be lonely, but it's like you come into this world alone, you die alone, and you yeah. find this sense of, of peace and serenity. And I had this weird thing. I was watching This Is Us. Five episodes, five seasons of This Is Us binge watching till 6 a.m. till I actually felt good about myself. I'm watching, I love this show. And then I'm looking at my cat, the music comes on, I start, you know, doing this with my cat. My cat's like, and I'm like, and I'm like, I love you, cat. And then this feeling of like peace. There's no guy in my life, still COVID. I don't know what's going on with my career. I got a little dribs and drabs of work and this sense of peace. And I'm like, I didn't miss fruit. I, this, I didn't drink today. I didn't like, I literally, whatever you, I'm, I'm sober. I'm, and I'm like, this is, this is what I was looking for. And it was, I couldn't, can't describe what it was, but it was the sense of peace came over me. It was so fleeting, but it was powerful enough for me to know, like Baba Ram does, you can find these moments and they're yeah. all you've really been searching for that you're okay the way you are, whether you put on a couple pounds, whether you got a little bit of a muffin top, whether you've gotten all the whatever, and yeah. it's going to be okay. And just kind of let life kind of happen and ask just to be in God's grace. And it could be source energy. It could be nature. It could be whatever you define as God. That's and right. That's kind of what I came, that's kind of what happened. Vanessa, when you, uh, you know, you said some, you said a lot of really beautiful things and thank you so much for sharing that. That was, uh, I know it's, it's hard to go back and revisit painful things and bring them up. So thank you so much for sharing that. I, um, I, you, you said something really brilliant and which is, you know, when things happen very easily, you are, you are with God, right? You are like in, you're, God. you know, you're, you're in God's will because, you know, your, your soul is surf, serving the purpose you were put in, on this planet for. That's why it's just so easy, right? Things are just happen and then other things you're like why isn't it happening i want this so bad and god knows i've been through that a gajillion fucking times uh and continue to and um i i wanted to actually ask you this because um i went through a very similar thing with you my my father died uh in 2005 he died a young man he was only 56 and my father and i had a very tumultuous relationship because like i mentioned he was very physically abusive towards me, my mother. He was just very, you know, he was pretty much a very smart, ambitious man, but also really, really disturbed. And um, when my father came to visit in 2005, I confronted him of all the shit he had done to me and my mother and my father broke down and he turned into this child 
that I was just like, who, who, who is this person? Like, what, what the fuck is happening? Why are you turning into a child? And it was like, as if he was having, it's as if I created the space for him to come and be that vulnerable child that he wasn't allowed to be growing up in his family, right? And uh, my father died. And then I went through a divorce because I was married for nine and a half years while I was living in New York City. And I remember being like, fuck it, pissed. I would be like full of rage all the time. Um, and then um, I had gotten a job. I was doing another, uh, you know, one of the finance jobs at Morgan Stanley. And I remember doing lunch, walking down 8th Avenue. And this man walked up to me and he goes, uh, excuse me, I'm looking for directions. I was like, sure. You know, in New York City, you get asked stopped all the time. I was like, yeah, sure. And then he just stopped and looked at me. He goes, don't be so mad at God. He believes in you. Oh, my God. I was like, excuse me? And he goes, don't be so angry. Who passed away? Your father? I was like, excuse me? And I was like, what the fuck now? Who are you? I was, he was just like, I, God wants me to let you know. He doesn't want you to be so mad at him. He, he, he believes in you. He believes in you. I just started bawling in the middle of 8th Avenue. I'm like, who the fuck are you? Why are you talking to me? Like, huh? In front of him. I'm like bawling. He's like, he's like, you know, he's like, I was brought here to pass this message on to you. Don't be so mad at him. Don't be so mad at him. He, he created this because he wants you to grow. He wants you to grow as a person. So, you know, don't be so mad at him. He loves you. And I was like, fucking bawling my eyes out. So that's how I ended up getting back on my journey of you know, faith and like finding the faith again. What, what, what was that moment for you where you found the faith in your, you know, in God again and when you weren't so mad at him anymore after all the things you had been through after losing your husband? I have to say this and try not, try not to cry. I didn't, you know, Carol said really I'll do cry that. with you so you don't feel alone, Vanessa. I don't know what interview you had with Carol, but like every, there's such a simpatico with you that it's um, an, a, a good energy. Um, but she really encouraged me to do the interview with you. She's like, Mona's Aww. amazing. And I said, oh, mm-hmm. all right, I'll, I love Carol. I'll put it in. I'll put it in. But um, I was, I couldn't stop drinking. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm becoming my dad, but I'm not mean. I've been mean, mean to a couple people, but mm-hmm. I can't stop drinking. I went to AA, couldn't stop drinking. Yeah. Um, lost my mother, I even told my mother. I said, mom, I, I I got to go to AA. I would visit her and then I would drink. And I mean, drinking like two bottles of wine a day, <laughs> like at the point wow. where I wasn't even slurring. It was like medicine. Just mm. to go. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God. And yeah. I needed, I called her. I couldn't afford a rehab. I was struggling. Yeah. And I, and I went to, um, and then my mother died. And I'm like, you've got to stay sober for your mother. You got to deliver. You got to do a eulogy. You got to keep your shit together. You have to honor your mother, the, the music, everything. And um, I remember my mother said, <laughs> she's like, when you want to drink wine, why can't you just have blueberries? Well, what can, why can't you what? Just have blueberries. <laughs> said, Mom, Blueberries would help me stop drinking. I'd shove a bushel up my ass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Goodness, I, Vanessa. I said, I can't see you for a couple weeks. I need right. to get, I need to stop drinking. And then I will come up and visit you. I'll call you. So long story short, my mother had ended up dying. I mean, I did see her back and forth and I did start to sober up. And these two women from AA came to the funeral. And then one woman was Australian and she saw, there was a woman that a friend of hers ran um, Pacific uh, Rehab, very expensive uh, rehab in Australia. Yeah. And she, we became friends. I loved her, Jane. She was just so upbeat and so positive and just, I mean, every time we go to Starbucks, Guys, would I'd be like, we'll get a free coffee just with your accent alone. She'd be like, oh, hello, darling. Oh, Mona. It's so great to be here. And, yeah, I love Vanessa. It's very funny. Um, but, yeah, can I get a, a, can I get it with a, a decaf? A decaf. Oh, you made it with cat's cap. Okay. Would, could I trouble you for another? Oh, thank you, darling. 
thank you. I mean, she was like one of those. And Aww. always dressed beautifully, always feminine. Yeah. Just all right. So I end up, I'm still struggling. I'm in AA, still drinking. I'm going to meetings and drinking. Like I can't, I can't stop. I'm talking to God. I'm talking to Lucian. Well, Lucian, if you didn't think I was an alcoholic when you knew me, I've become one now, you know? Yeah. And he, like yeah. starting to pray to Bill Wilson. I'm like, all right, God, where, just take it away. Take the feeling away. I'm doing everything. I admit that. And I'm, I started praying to Bill Wilson. <laughs> and also to see Dr. Bob. I'm like, maybe you'll hear me. And then my friend said, are you sitting down? Um, and he said, I just found out that they will, uh, that um, Lorraine, if you can just get your ticket to Australia, well, she's going to pay for your entire rehab. rehab yeah. I knew I had nothing to do with that. I did nothing except yeah. ask God for help. <laughs> Wow. And I over, I got a sixty thousand dollar help in a rehab, and there I was walking along the beach, mm. and I thought, "Are you there, God?" And this huge wave like knocked me over, and I was like, "I, I guess you are. I guess you are." And thank you, thank you for this gift and my friends and the love, and I'm sober. And yeah, stay wow. So that, that was my wow. But I see you have a book out, don't you? No. What? What? I can't write a book. I no. I've written so much stuff. I like to write to perform. I don't like to write to write. I write for hours, but I love to share it. I, it's like I'm yeah. not. Um, I've had. I've been told to write a book, but I wrote. I'm working on a series. I I'm working on a series um, about based on your life. Based on my life, but no, based on kind of my dad, and my mom's life, how they met. Leary, Bob Ramdas, and then slowly my life, it enters how my dad and I become one. You know, we become the same person. I did everything to not become like my father, only to become like my father, you know? Oh, shit, Vanessa. I always say that I'm my father's daughter every time. I am just like my dad, just like him. I, God knows that I've been in therapy for 13 years and been working on my rage. Um, I have some rage issues sometimes, um, but uh, I try to, you know, work on them. I think for me, we didn't. I didn't have the uh, the alcohol part. I had these uh, bursts of rages where I black out, where I don't remember why I was so angry about stuff, where I just go in these bouts of rages where it's just like, oh, it's like an out-of-body experience where my sane self leaves my body and is like watching the whole thing play out and be like, what are you doing? Oh my God, what the fuck? And I'm just on a fucking path of destruction. And I've been really working on that part of myself to just not allow myself to be, to, to those really fix those triggers right if we can fix the triggers then we can then we can curtail the demon but um my god i uh you know i i guess you know it's like the that saying that that quote that uh, robin williams would say you know it's like be kind to people you know everybody's fighting a battle in their own way there everybody's fighting i'm, I'm paraphrasing something that, which is which is so true right like you know, when I when I saw your set on women of a certain age, uh, first of all, I just loved it. And when I watched you and now I'm talking to you, like, I would never really put this person together with that person, right? Because that person is fucking hysterical on stage. And then there's this person who's experienced so much pain and tragedy and loss over and over again. And and become this amazing, incredible alchemist and this incredible spiritual being, you know, that's out there like spreading love and joy to the rest of the world. And it's like I feel like you are like the prime example of that quote by Robin Williams, right? Because you've been fighting all these battles, and yet when you step up on stage, you just put all that shit aside, and you're just like, "We're here to fucking work," and you know, I'm gonna kill this, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm, I know I want to be I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. What projects? I know you said you just shot a movie called I'm Elton. I'm telling you. Yeah. I'll, um, I don't know when it's gonna come out. We just shot yeah. it yesterday, so probably not for a few months. But one of my greatest joys through all of this thing about giving, you know, g giving and 
is being confused. And I have many days where I question God, but I always have a sense that he's around. And I looked everywhere for just this good feeling, but I always believed in him. I always believed in him. And my mom would have a picture of Jesus in her like, you know, room where she would do dancing. And I remember painting a yellow hat on him and putting him like on the floor and, you know, to make him like a little, like, a, like I had a friend around. Cause it was always, you know, God knows what was going to happen. But, um, I was so devastated with this. I realized how much my self-esteem I based on my comedy, my approval I needed couldn't get it from within. I never was able to. So for all this alchemy and wanting to give and what, it was so hard at moments of it. But when I started teaching comedy to comedians, there was so much joy. I did it for the sake of getting them funny. And I had so much joy teaching and it was about giving and that's yes. kind of my, and my therapist said you know what when you talk about you show your eyes light up when you were dating that guy that didn't work out narc he's narc guy um yeah. no, so, so, your students your eyes light up oh so are you still teaching comedy classes yeah i went i went from eight students to 36 and we just wow. had the whole thing yeah and now i'm back to i've got two sold out classes now good for you are these uh, these are zoom classes during the pandemic i'm thinking yes yeah, yeah. And i offer like um stand-up comedy type five and then crowd work um and then hosting crowd work and heckling to just equip people and then i take all the experience i have or all the punch-ups that I can do. And I just pass all that information to everybody because I've had like 30 years being a comic and it was like, I don't want to, you know, some people are like, don't give your secrets away. And I'm like, no, give your secrets away. Yeah. That was the yeah. biggest lesson I learned that if you say something mean on stage, I'll give you a little secret. You might know it. If you say something mean on stage, you say it with a smile, you will get away with it a lot more. That's right. No one will know. Yeah, you know who's the king of that? You know who's the king of that? Who does that really well and does it every time? Bill Burr. He does yeah. a really good job yeah. at it. He's always yeah. he's just like the laughing or the <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. he would he does this whole bit about Steve Jobs. He's like, yeah, nerd god, and then he smiles, and it's like you know because he can see the room just like pulling right. back, right? And right. doing all the smile. He does it really well. Chris Rock does a really good job with the smile and saying the 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 mean thing. Um, Vanessa, where can people follow you and where can they take your comedy classes if they want to? They can contact uh, they can contact Heather Lehrman at SOS Comedy. Okay. Is it SOSComedy.com? SOSComedy.com, yeah. And Heather Lehrman, L A H uh, L I'm sorry, L E H R M A N. Uh, they can also contact me on Facebook. Just send me a message and I'll, I'll patch them through and uh, I'll get them to Heather. And um, I was going to take a break over the summer, but if it keeps going, you know, keep going, I'm going to um, not as I, I, I just would say Heather Lehrman. I don't, she's still working on her website. So yeah. probably, been, probably just Heather Lehrman. Um, oh, okay. Okay. We got we got Heather Lehrman. SOS yeah. Comedy page. She's there, but you can just write her, write me, Vanessa Holling said, um, Facebook. But she's going to help bring me into the 21st century because I still have my <laughs> nice face on Facebook. I mean, this is an embarrassment. <laughs> and I always reflect that I go, I'm a writer, I'm creative, I don't know how to, you know. Vanessa, don't even get me started on Facebook. I've been... Um, I was calling this bullshit out on Facebook and then Facebook banned me for 30 days because I said something that Good they felt you. that, and I'm like, Fuck what did you. you say? And they banned you? They banned, they banned me for 30 days. Yeah. Can yeah, you say not, it or would you prefer not to say it in case they like, <laughs> <laughs> probably the, the banning it. there was a, there was a lady that was in Vegas, I believe in Nevada. And she was attacking this Native American lady and telling her to go back where she came from. And she was like, I'm Native American. Like, I am the American. Everybody else is immigrants. Right. Like, right. So she was like, forget about me. I'm a Native American. Where are you from? Like, what are you telling me? Right. Yes. Like, why are you running your mouth like this? This is so yes. ridiculous. And then she got up to this poor woman's face. And touched her, so the lady turned around and slapped her in the face, which is absolutely not right. Because she was like, 
why are you putting your hands on me? I didn't do anything to you. Like, what is your problem? And I called this woman who, you know, the the crazy lady, uh, the, I called her a cum dumpster. Um, and then Facebook was like, that is considered bullying. And I was like, that is not bullying. That is a name. That is a name calling. That is not bullying. And then they banned me for 30 days. Can you believe this shit? And they found it. They found you. They found you. Yeah, they found they they were like this word has come up and I'm like, ah fuck you, Facebook. You had fucking Trump on for fucking four years running his bullshit ass ad campaigns. You didn't have a problem with that because you were getting big money for it. And I'm the fucking problem. Get the fuck out of here. Seriously. Get the fuck out of here. Did you say that to them too? Did you add that when they banned you? you I did. When I wrote them a comment, I was like, get the fuck out of here. You guys are full of shit, you know? And I was like, fuck you, Facebook. You're going to eventually erode anyway. Twitch and all this shit I'm streaming on like now is the future anyway. So who cares? You know, and and that oh, was that. And hopefully, I'm not gonna. Twitch, it's called Twitch. Just help me out here. I don't even. Know. <laughs> yes, it's called Twitch. It's actually a lot more. A lot of comedians are using it, but a lot of gamers use it. A lot of gamers. So you can bring on all these friends and all these people watch you play video games. That is not my world. Uh, but comedy. A lot of comedians have been doing Twitch. So yeah, maybe you can tell Heather to get you up on Twitch. That's another really good platform to get on. Yeah, yeah I didn't even know that. Yeah, I didn't even know that. So um. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, I got banned from Facebook too from making friends, but I just with so many working with so many um performing for Republicans and Democrats, it doesn't serve me to say anything pro or against. <laughs> I just say I hate Jeff Bezos. That seems to do well, but <laughs> everybody's he's like, like Jeff he's like my Switzerland. Yeah, right. It's like pay your taxes, damn it. Yeah, pay your taxes. Yeah, pay your t- I know, I know. And Facebook okay. just pay, you know, then that usually, yeah, no, Republicans and Democrats will agree. Yeah, yeah. Pay then, your but if, but if, he, if he decided to buy my special because he owns Amazon, I'd be like, yeah. all right, I'm going to let it go. We'll let that go. Okay. You know, that'd be a guy. I'm going to eat your Satan with that smile, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. That le- fucking Lex Luthor look he got going on there trying to take over the world. Yeah, that whole look. And that smile on Facebook. Like, is it going to be the flag? Is it going to be the future? I just feel like all corporations are taking over this globalization. That's, That's right. what frightens me and that yep. we've sold our democracy to corporations and that needs yep. to be addressed from the inside out. Yep. That's what I really mean, troubles me. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. It's like, That's right. they, it doesn't matter. That's right. That's right. We'll have a fight about this crap. Go ahead. That's right. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, really, it, I mean, if you look at what happened to the small mom and chip pop shops during the, you know, during the pandemic, I mean, there are millions of uh, small businesses that went out of business. And guess who picked them up? Big corporations. They came and absorbed all their customers. So now those corporations just got even bigger. I mean, my God, Jeff Bezos. Like what? Uh, how many more? How many more trillions of dollars did he put away in his pocket? I know, and he won't let his ro- workers unionize. That's like give him a union. That's right. He's not gonna. He's not gonna let do that, Vanessa. Come on. He's not gonna. He's not gonna. You know. He has to pay for plastic surgery for his girlfriend who looks like a clown. Um. Yeah. Have you seen her? Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is that is bad plastic surgery. Holy shit. That is just and really it's not even work. about money with these people. It's power and accumulation. Right. It's more like it's insanity to me. Yeah. I never right. want that amount of money because I, I think it would make you crazy and you that's couldn't right. trust anyone. That's right. It's like, what are you going to take it to the grave with you? Yeah, give it away. Jeff, go give it away. Just give, give it, it away. You. And you still, I and you still let fun. me start. That is my talk about a pet peeve. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Well, maybe next time we can bring you on, we can just take a giant shit on Jeff Bezos together. Maybe we can do that next time. <laughs> you know, he has an algorithm, and we get like, <laughs> like no, you're not going to be getting in your packages in 24 hours. Sorry. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get uh, some strange white powder in your packages yeah. every time you order. Go to some mom and pop shops and go have them send something from uh, China, from China, and right. uh, you know. It's funny because I ordered something from China and they emailed me and they said, it's going to take 15 to 20 days to get your parcel. I was like, that's right. fine. I will wait. Yeah. It's yeah. fine. I'll yeah. support small business, you know? Yeah. But Nessa, this right. was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was my absolute pleasure. Oh, so thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm planning on being in New York this year. So when I do, I would love to meet up with you. Oh my God. When are you planning on coming? Are you going to see Carol? 
I would love to see you guys. I would love to see Kara. I would love to see you. Um, what are the comedians you want to see when you plan on coming or just friends or just like to, to come back to the... Um, I think it's probably just coming in there. And I know that a lot of the comedy clubs are opening back up, right? Like so much stuff is open. And LA's like that too. A lot of, lot of stuff here is uh, opening back up because our governor just said that come June 15th, they're trying to remove a mask mandate. So that's really going to open things up. So... But I know Governor being, Cuomo. Being, being a woman, being a woman now, and you're uh, just a beautiful, intelligent, oh, funny okay. woman, which you are. I mean, I'm like, God, I'm looking at myself. I'm like, God, I thought I looked good for my age. She's so fucking stunning looking. Um, oh my God. What are you talking about? You're so beautiful. Tiny. So, I mean, you know, you're absolutely beautiful. So oh, I was thinking, had a so poor sweet. mother online. She must have been beautiful too. And oh, poor mom. Like I ended up thinking about her online. I'm gonna give my kids a better life. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Standing in line, yeah, standing, standing in line. line and probably looking very pretty and scared. Um, um, maybe yeah. she was tough. She's like, do not, do yeah. not. I, 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 She's like walking around with the <laughs> red pepper in her purse, just to throw yeah. it in people's or eyes. Acid. She has some acid. That's um, her. That's her pepper spray. Oh um, right. yeah. That it would be good for uh, you know who you are. You know, just get spots just because you're in. You're Indian, Pakistan, American. The way you look, you, and you get you do your comedy, and just go have a good time. And you would be put on before they would put, like, say, a white guy on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's I, I, a lot more for women, especially women. Yeah, I want us to go before any dude. Period. Uh, let's yeah. just, let me yeah. just say that, Vanessa. Let me yeah. just let me just say that. But yes, I would totally love to meet up with you. But thank you so very much for this, and uh, I will definitely talk to you soon. So thank you. Okay. Again. Okay. Thank you. Right. Take care. Take care, Vanessa. Bye. That was the lovely Vanessa Hollingshead. My God, uh, what a beautiful, lovely, spiritual, ambitious conversation that was. I uh, I had to pull up my tissue and wipe my eyes because uh, Vanessa really touched my heart in, in so many ways and so many things that we discussed. You guys, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do. You can go to youtube.com forward slash Mona Shake and the word comedian. Same name on Facebook and same name on TikTok. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Mona's Comedy. Tim is here. Hiya, Tim. Love you, Mona. Love you, too. And said, Mona, stop in Delaware. We'd love to meet you. I would love to do that as well, Tim. Thank you very much, you guys. Have a great evening and a great weekend. I'm going to go smoke some weed. Good night. Stay safe out there. Please put your masks on until this shit is over.